A reading from To Bless the Space Between Us by Irish poet John O'Donohue. The beauty of nature insists on taking its time. Everything is prepared. Nothing is rushed. The rhythm of emergence is a gradual, slow beat, always inching its way forward. Change remains faithful to itself until the new unfolds in the full confidence of true arrival. Because nothing is abrupt, the beginning of spring nearly always catches us unawares. It is there before we see it, and then we can look nowhere without seeing it. Change arrives in nature when time has ripened. There are no jagged transitions or crude discontinuities. This accounts for the sureness with which one season succeeds another. It is as though they were moving forward in a rhythm set from within a continuum. To change is one of the great dreams of every heart. To change the limitations, the sameness, the banality, or the pain. So often we look back on patterns of behavior, the kind of decisions we make repeatedly and that have failed to serve us well, and we aim for a new and more successful path or way of living. But change is difficult for us. So often we opt to continue the old pattern rather than risking the danger of difference. We are also often surprised by change change that seems to arrive out of nowhere. We find ourselves crossing some new threshold we had never anticipated, like spring secretly at work within the heart of winter. Below the surface of our lives, huge changes are in fermentation. We never suspect a thing. Then when the grip of some long, enduring winter mentality begins to loosen, we find ourselves vulnerable to a flourish of possibility and we are suddenly negotiating the challenge of a threshold. At any time, you can ask yourself, at which threshold am I now standing? At this time in my life, what am I leaving? Where am I about to enter? What is preventing me from crossing my next threshold? What gift would enable me to do it? A threshold is not a simple boundary. It is a frontier that divides two different territories, rhythms, and atmospheres. Indeed, it is a lovely testimony to the fullness and integrity of an experience or a stage of life that it intensifies toward the end into a real frontier that cannot be crossed without the heart passionately engaged and woken up. At this threshold, a great complexity of emotion comes alive. Confusion, fear, excitement, sadness, hope. This is one of the reasons such vital crossings were always clothed in ritual. It is wise in your own life to be able to recognize and acknowledge the key thresholds, to take your time to feel all the varieties of presence that accrue there, to listen inward with complete attention until you hear the inner voice calling you forward. The time has come to cross. Sometimes the story we tell ourselves is not really true. Sometimes the story others tell about us is not really true. Here on today's Heart Lift with Janelle, we are going to learn how to rewrite our story. So pick up your favorite pen and journal, grab a cup of something delicious, and start your heart lifting journey towards living a meaningful life. Hello and welcome to today's Heart Lift with Janelle. I'm so happy that you are here with me today and the Stronger Everyday community. Welcome, welcome. 
take a seat, make sure you have that cup of something delicious because today is good. We are moving into tool six today. We're in our reset, our season of reset. Yep, it's taken a little longer than I thought it would, but that's okay. We're taking our time. The initial intent of this whole journey, heartlifting journey through Stronger Every Day, Nine Tools to an Emotionally Healthy You was to take time and process and grow and saunter and sit and see. There is no rush. In fact, tool six invites us into what I'm calling from rushing to hushing. From rushing to hushing. Part two, the three tools in our second movement of our journey shift from shaming to gracing, where we looked and taught ourselves about what self-compassion looks like to shift our language of shaming ourselves, judging, blaming, to a language of grace, where we're kind, compassionate, author- have, have authority in our lives. We speak truth into our lives, but we do it with love. Tool five, speak healing words to your future. We talked about how to use, how to first find and then use our new voice, our voice that is laced with value, worth, and dignity. Because in this community, you know, (laughs) say it with me, voice equates value. When I know who I am, when I know whose I am, then I can think for myself, I can speak for myself, I can act for myself, I know what I know. And that helps me be less dependent on uh, others in a good, healthy, autonomous way. Tool six is all about soaking in living water. We're going to talk this, this, yeah, I say it all the time, but this is such a profound study on what that living water is that Jesus Christ talked about in John four when he was talking to this famed woman at the well. So we're going to meet her and we're going to soak in living water beliefs instead of limiting false beliefs that perhaps have ruled our lives. Educate in the Latin means to lead out, to teach, to train, or inform someone. Education, then, is to draw out or unfold the powers of the mind. I learned about this early on when I was a teacher back in the day. In the beautiful uh, approach that I learned was about helping students internalize and own the information instead of just regurgitating it. So it was more introspective. It was more internal. I wrote my own curriculum back in the day. We didn't have curriculum. They have since developed one. Their thinking is that when the teacher internalizes it herself, then it is going to lead the child into a different realm of learning rather than just memorization or recitation of facts. So as your heartlifting journey guide here, your teacher, I want to unfold the powers of your mind and help you to grasp this material and to take it and make it your own, because that's what it means to truly learn. The footing for this second movement, this part two of educate, is Ephesians 1, particularly verse 18. And I'm going to make it very personal for us here. Open the eyes of our hearts, God, and let the light of your truth flood in. Shine your light on the hope you are calling them or us to embrace. Reveal to us the glorious riches you are preparing as our inheritance. And I thought since this tool's this tool is based on spiritual growth and spiritual formation, we're going to take We're going to take a second. We're going to take a minute. We're going to take a few and read all of Ephesians 1. It is particularly our footing as followers of Christ. I was taught early on in my spiritual journey that Ephesians 1 is like our last will and testament. It shares with us our spiritual inheritance, what we can actually expect in all of the right ways that we are going to be given by God. So I just want you to find a place, a quiet place, 
and allow these words. Let's Lexio Divina, Ephesians 1. Close your eyes if you can. Let the words soak over you. I will only read it once for the sake of our time here together. In true Lexio Divina, we'd read it twice, three times. Allow the words, I'm reading from the voice version, to invite you in and notice what do you hear? What whispers do you hear from the Spirit of God? Ephesians 1. Paul, an emissary of Jesus the Anointed, directly commissioned as his representative by the will of God to the saints in Ephesus, faithful in Jesus the Anointed. May God the Father and the Lord Jesus the Anointed surround you with grace and peace. This letter that Paul is writing begins with praise and thanksgiving to God the Father who blesses us, to Jesus who redeems us, and the Holy Spirit who seals us. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, who grants us every spiritual blessing in these heavenly realms where we live in the Anointed, not because of anything we have done, but because of what He has done for us. God chose us. He chose us to be in a relationship with Him even before He laid out plans for this world. He wanted us to live holy lives, characterized by love, free from sin, and blameless before Him. He destined us to be adopted as His children through the covenant Jesus the Anointed inaugurated in His sacrificial life. This was God's pleasure and God's will for you and for me. Ultimately, God is the one worthy of praise for showing us His grace. He's merciful and marvelous, freely giving us these gifts in His beloved. Visualize this. His blood freely flowing down the cross, setting us free. We are forgiven for our sinful ways by the richness of His grace, which He has poured all over us. With all wisdom and insight, He has enlightened us to the great mystery at the center of His will. With immense pleasure, He laid out His intentions through Jesus, a plan that will climax when the time is right as he returns to create order and unity both in heaven and on earth when all things are brought together under the anointed's royal rule. In him we stand to inherit even more. As his heirs, you, me, we are destined to play a key role in his unfolding purpose that is energizing everything to conform to his will. As a result, we, the first to place our hope in the anointed one, will live in a way to bring him glory and praise. Because you too have heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and because you believed in the one who is truth. Your lives, that's you and me, are marked with his seal. This is none other than the Holy Spirit who was promised as the guarantee toward the inheritance we are to receive when he frees and rescues all who belong to him. To God be all glory and praise. This is why when I heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus that is present in your community, this is now Paul speaking to Ephesus, and of your great love for all God's people, I haven't stopped thanking him for you. I am continually speaking to him on your behalf in my prayers. And here's what I say. God of our Lord Jesus, the anointed, Father of glory, I call out to you on behalf of your people. Give them minds ready to receive wisdom and revelation so they will truly know you. And here is our verse 18, our footing. Open the eyes of their hearts and let the light of your truth flood in. Shine your light on the hope you are calling them to embrace. Reveal to them the glorious riches you are preparing as their inheritance. Let them see the full extent of your power that is at work in those of us who believe. And may it be done according to your might and power. Friends, 
It is this same might and resurrection power that he used in the anointed one to raise him from the dead and to position him at his right hand in heaven. There is nothing over him. He's above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, over every name invoked, over every title bestowed in this age and the next. God has placed all things beneath his feet and anointed him as the head over all things for his church. This church is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all in all. Ephesians 1. Tool 6 begins with an introduction to one of my favorite people, a remarkable young woman named Laura. We were having a conversation, as we always do, in a a public place, so uh, we try to keep our voices down because we tend to go really, really deep, and yet I get real excited, so I'm always having to be constantly aware because our conversations are always so riveting and we go so deep. And... We were talking about this subject of being inspirational just because you have a disability. Because you see, as I call her limitless Laura in the book, Laura does have a, a, a disability. It's called arthrogryposis. I'll put some links and information in the show notes so you can learn more. And so she is, in the words of, I guess, you know, we would just call her disabled. I have a hard time even saying it because she's the most abled person I've ever met in my life to the fact that she doesn't even see her disability, like, but, but it's there. And so our time together has, has always been wrestling with, who how does Laura live her life being fully dependent on her parents and friends and community for absolutely everything? Yet in her mind, she's limitless. She's brilliant. She's a poet. She writes. She's a writer. She's just remarkable in her, her mental state is so clear. And so this day, as I write, we were, we were dealing with this question. Are we, the physically disabled, inspirations for simply living with a disability in the day-to-day? This just frustrates her so much that she would be an inspiration just for living her life. Just the sheer fact that we get out of bed and live our days confined by disability? Why is that so inspiring? She was frustrated in a good way and baffled at how she and her disability inspires others. I like to think of Laura as an inclusion architect. She uses her frustrations and personal challenges to make the world a better, safer place for all beings, disabled or able-bodied. Much like a builder or architect designs a home or building with disability access, Laura longs to design emotional health access and healthy inclusion for the disabled. So we looked at this word inspiration from a multitude of different angles. We tried to examine the perceptions of various observers, children, adults, strangers, peers, our passionometer, Needle went way to the right and brought us to one strong conclusion. We should all be inspiring one another as we do life together. Well, I said, Laura, you inspire me because every single morning you wake up and you face your arthrogryposis with vigor and courage. I inspire you because I work, study, and help women find their full potential. Inspiration encompasses every single person on the face of the earth, the disabled and the able-bodied. We ended our conversation with the biggest question of all. This is the drum roll. Aren't we all disabled in some way? One One definition of disability puts it this way. Impaired or limited by a physical mental, cognitive, or developmental condition. Yeah. We're going to note the word cognitive here as we'll be coming back to this critical aspect of disability in tool six, cognitive disabilities. When you look at disability from this angle, it being physical or mental or cognitive or developmental, it seems to be a bit more universal, doesn't it? Because of her fancy wheelchair, though, Laura's disability is so obvious. 
and it's noticeable everywhere. She can't go anywhere because she's noticeably in a wheelchair. It's much easier to move through a room with less visible disabilities, such as depression or anxiety or social anxiety, as they can be more private in nature. We can hide those, can't we? We can actually hide mental thorns, cognitive disabilities. This might make a person look sad or down, but that person would not be labeled disabled. Laura says this, think of it this way. Both of us can be inspired to keep going forward in life, to keep reaching for the next normal thing or the next impossible dream. Yes, I shouted. And I was like, oh, I got to get control because we're in a public place and I'm supposed to be a little bit more quiet. I didn't want to embarrass Laura. That's the real bottom line, isn't it? So I write on page 156, the first time I met Laura, I knew she was a remarkable human being who had the fight and fury of an overcomer inside of her, in her mind, in her mind. She is 100% capable of doing anything and everything. She sees absolutely no limitations. Huge shout out to her parents and her siblings who must have just done such a great job at giving her secure attachment and a healthy sense of self because she's truly remarkable. She's her own woman. She accepts no sympathy. In fact, she is very frustrated by it. Nor does she want any special treatment, yet she needs it. But she doesn't want it. In her mind, she is whole. She is able-bodied. I clearly remember the defining moment we were sitting in a garden when I had to gently yet firmly break the news to Laura that she is indeed different. Her brow crinkled. Her head tilted. And her eyes seemed to say, I'm not really sure what you mean. How am I different? I was like, oh my gosh. In that moment, though, my deep admiration and respect for her transformed into absolute sheer inspiration. She sees no limitations, even though she is highly limited, at least physically. And for that reason alone, I couldn't help but tell her what an inspiration she is to me. But I'm just being me. Why is that so inspiring? Oh, she desperately wants to be inspiring just for being her, not for being disabled her. Laura, I just said, let's just take a closer look at the root word of inspiration, inspire. I think it's worth our time. So inspire comes from the Latin inspirare, something like that, meaning breathe or blow into. Breathe or blow into. The word was originally used of a divine or supernatural being in the sense that they imparted a truth or an idea to someone. So as we're moving in tool six, I'm going to key in here on this podcast episode on how we can inspire each other, how we can breathe into each other ideas, truths that move us forward in our life to become our very best God-breathed self. And in doing so, we leave a God-breathed size legacy. So couldn't we say this? This is what we, we, we always debate and so rich. Could we say that to inspire or to be an actual inspiration to others simply looks like breathing truth, breathing ideas, breathing new life into the world around us. Laura breathes new life and new ideas and new inspiration and new faith and new truth and new joy into my life every time we meet. Particularly when we talk about limits and limitations and how they relate to mental and emotional boundaries. So I'm on page 157 today. We're going to kind of sit here, even though there's so much in tool six, But I feel like this is so critically important, and we will be hearing from Laura in the future. Don't you worry. It's coming. Laura and I both agreed that as difficult as physical abilities are, it's also equally as difficult to have cognitive disabilities. That is mental disabilities, or as some might say, a mental handicap, a mental limitation, These disabilities are challenging because they're invisible to the naked eye. Remember, Laura's disability is fully visible. She is in a motorized wheelchair. She rolls into the room with such confidence and strength, and she's just remarkable, as I've said. (laughs) So 
these disabilities that are invisible to the naked eye are really challenging. And I say, can you put a brace or a cast on your mind? No. Can you put a sling on the prefrontal cortex? Mm -mm. Can you stitch up an emotional wound? No. Can you detect the shame that's folded into neural pathways, those deeply rutted pathways in your brain that are so hard to navigate out of unless led by a trained, trauma-informed specialist like myself who actually has a tool, aroma freedom technique, or maybe EMDR or neurofeedback to help you renew your mind? Can you bind a grudge with butterfly closure strips? <laughs> no. Can you give your heart crutches and tell it not to put any weight on itself for six weeks? No. And you can't send your heart to physical therapy. I wish you could. We can go to mental therapy. But once again, when it's invisible, it's a little bit harder to navigate. But we can head to our new mental gym that I give you here inside of Stronger Every Day and implement our heart-lifting workout. But in general, there aren't many, if any, actual spaces or places to develop and strengthen emotional health. It's a tough subject on so many levels, and we're facing it so clearly now with this COVID pandemic crisis and major athletes and those who are in the public eye are speaking about it more, which is helpful. Traditionally, conversations about our emotional health happen inside a counseling or therapy office, but my hope here today is that we can expand this conversation beyond the walls and into the hallways of our homes and churches and schools and offices. Practicing psychotherapist Richard Winter refers to these cognitive disabilities or difficulties as mental thorns. I mentioned this earlier. He writes, It's perhaps easier to come to terms with an obvious physical disability such as being born with only one arm. You know what you have to accept and you know your limitations. But when it comes to psychological disabilities, what I call mental thorns They are not so easy to define, and we do not know how much they will change in this life. Through our weakness, through the brokenness of our bodies and minds, God is working out his purpose of changing us into his image. He's doing the work of Ephesians 1 that we read about. Yes, I believe in the Christ who went to the cross, who took my shame, took my sins upon himself. He visited hell. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. I believe in what we would call the salvation story. And I now follow and have been following Jesus the Christ for over four decades. So when we look at the word limit, limitation, and unlimited, I want you just to to lean in here. This is our teaching moment today, and it's on page 158. A limit is is a point or level beyond which something does not or may not extend or pass. A limit is the furthest extent of one's physical or mental endurance, a restriction on the size and amount of something permissible or possible. So take some time to really just look at that, let it soak in. A limitation, (laughs) which I... Definitely, as a type A, overachieving, high-functioning, highly anxious young woman, didn't even understand that I had limitations, foolishly. We have limitations, therefore are good. A limitation is a limiting rule or condition, a restriction, a shortcoming, or a defect. So sometimes it is framed that way. But we're not framing it that way here in Tool 6. Unlimited is having no restrictions or controls, having or seeming to have no boundaries, infinite, without qualification or exception, absolute, unlimited. Some synonyms for unlimited is inexhaustible, boundless, immense, vast, great. That's our eternal inheritance that we read about in Ephesians 1. 
It is inexhaustible, unimaginable. Paul writes later in Ephesians, Ephesians 3.20, that we cannot even imagine in our wildest dreams what God has in store for us as we follow him. So in this tool, Soak in Living Water, what we're learning here is that we, yes, heartlifters, we have to come to terms with our humanity. You see, God was both divine and human. Once we understand that we are spiritual beings in a human body, Then we can begin practicing the skillful art of setting healthy emotional limits and limitations known in the psychological realm as healthy mental, emotional, and relational boundaries. Often the hardest part of writing and living into a new narrative is coming to terms with our own personal mental thorns, our cognitive limitations, and discerning where, when, and how to establish healthy boundaries. Now, this is a great time to go back and listen to our beautiful episodes with Kimberly June Miller and Dr. Allison Cook on boundaries for your soul. This is a beautiful time to revisit those conversations or to pick up their book. Download it on Kindle. Go to Kimberly June Miller's site and grab all those goodies that she has. I would say in my own life that one of the most difficult parts of my journey has been learning to say no, recognizing I can't do it all and that I'm not supposed to do it all and understanding my value in order to use my voice. This is where we now move from that healthy assertiveness that we're practicing into establishing boundaries, both mental, physical, relational, and emotional boundaries in our lives that will help us truly embody the life that Christ has given us. I say so often, everybody's business is not our business. Can't do it all. I've learned the hard way that everyone's business, as I said, is not my business. But in the Judeo-Christian worldview, we're often told to love without limits. At least that is what I was taught. There's no limit on our love. We're to be selfless. We are to burn out rather than rust out. So not true. That's not what Jesus imaged for us. But we struggle to apply the principle in real life. I write on page 159. Turn the other cheek, we're told. Give until it hurts. Love my enemy. Forgive and forget. Let it go. Not help someone who needs me. The answer to these difficult questions is both yes and no, which challenges us to wrestle with the mystery involved in answering and understanding the mystery of how to live with this tension of setting limits, but also believing and asking for the limitless inflow of God's power in our life. I wholeheartedly believe that strong emotional health will lead us to authentic spiritual formation. I want to read a quote by the the beautiful Dr. Brene Brown in Braving the Wilderness. She writes this, Where is the line? Is there a line in the wilderness between what behavior is tolerable and what isn't? The reward may be great, but do I have to put up with someone tearing me down or questioning my actual right to exist? Is there a line that shouldn't be crossed? The answer is yes. In my research, the clearer and more respected the boundaries, the higher the level of empathy and compassion for others. Fewer clear boundaries, less openness. It's hard to stay kind-hearted when you feel people are taking advantage of you or threatening you. There is a line, and she writes this beautiful sentence, The line is etched from dignity. Well, hey, heartlifters, you know, our footing is we are clothed in strength and dignity with nothing to fear. We can smile at our future. Dignity, right? Dignity is one of the foundational principles of our community. 
God breathed his life and virtue into you, Heartlifter. You have value, worth, and dignity. Therefore, you can establish limits and boundaries to how people treat you, how people speak to you, how people use you. This is tough. This is a tough subject. That's why we won't get to all of what's in Tool 6, but you can read it and study it and stay tuned for deeper conversations. This Genesis 2-7 truth that we believe that we have inherent value, worth, and dignity because of Christ and what he did for us, that in that value, worth, and dignity, we have a voice, a valuable voice to say and set limits. We can do that. I'm giving us permission today. So as we move forward, I want you to keep in mind the words of author Donna Hicks on page 161. Dignity is our inherent value and worth as human beings. Everyone is born with it. Everyone recognizes that we all have a deep human desire to be treated as something of value. I believe that it is the highest common denominator. This shared desire for dignity transcends all of our differences. Hear me, please. Putting our common human identity above all else. While our uniqueness is important, history has shown us that if we don't take the next step towards recognizing our shared identity, conflicts in our workplace, our personal lives, and between nations will continue to abound. The glue that holds all of our relationships together lean in, lean in, lean in, is the mutual recognition of the desire to be seen, heard, listened to, and treated fairly, to be recognized, understood, and to feel safe in the world. That goes back to tool five when we were speaking of healthy assertiveness And how in a conversation or in a relationship, assertiveness, healthy assertiveness is taking into mind when you're speaking to someone, the other person's inherent value, worth, and dignity. You're not just talking at someone. You're talking with someone, which will most definitely require you as the listener to put aside your ego, your broken ego in most most places, or your insecurities or your inferiorities, to put aside all of your limitations that perhaps you've been carrying around your whole entire life in order just to hear the other person. Mm. Jesus mastered and modeled what we are talking about here, this methodology of creating safe places and spaces for people. In Tool 6, we talk about John 4 and the beautiful Samaritan woman, the famed Samaritan woman. And on 162, I write about Jesus's welcoming her at a well in Samaria, a place he shouldn't have been, a place he really wasn't wasn't supposed to be, but then again, we have Jesus who goes where he shouldn't go and he goes where his father tells him to go. And this day, his father said, you need to go to Samaria. I've got a woman there. She's an outcast of her community. She's had five husbands. Her life is a mess. She Nobody talks to her and she's going to come at the well midday because she wants to avoid all the other women. So I want you to go and I want you to meet this woman and you're going to offer her a new way, a different way of living. He meets a Samaritan woman. She's bound in her own very limiting belief system. Okay, so now there's a transition in our conversation from limitations to what we call limiting beliefs. And I'm just making a firm decision here. We're going to bring this to a close. I'm going to keep you on on the edge of the cliff because this is too important to rush through and I'm going to go and do part two. So if you don't have the book, go get it. If you do have it, we're going to be on page 162 when we pick this up because, guys, this is too important. 
I can't just stop here. We need to have a really strong conversation, a beautiful conversation about how Jesus offers this woman and us today a different way of living. Okay, till next time. Thanks for listening today. It was great having you here. For even more great content and resources, please join the Stronger Every Day online community at JanelleRairdon.com. Always remember, you, my friend, have value, worth, and dignity.